Okay, so let's talk about distal tibia and talus somatic dysfunction. So uh, when we're talking about each of these two, we're gonna be talking about the relative position of one versus the other. Um, so when considering how the talus moves relative to the distal tibia, we need to be thinking about the anatomy, we need to be thinking about the tibia, and then the fibula, the talus in the middle, that lives within the mortise that's created by the tibia and the fibula around that talus. Um, in terms of expected motions, we would expect that with dorsiflexion of the ankles, the talus is going to move relatively posterior, it's gonna move back into the mortise, and it's gonna move relatively posterior with the distal tibia kind of hovering anteriorly above it. And then with plantar flexion, we would expect the talus to move relatively anteriorly while the distal tibia remains posteriorly uh, behind it. Um, in terms of evaluation, we would contact, we'd make an effort to contact the talus as best we can within the mortise using our index fingers, middle fingers, uh, however it makes sense um, and however it's most comfortable. Um, but I usually use my index fingers here. And then uh, gripping the rest of the forefoot, you then have control over dorsal flexion and plantar flexion. Uh, what you're gonna be evaluating is one side as compared to the other. You're gonna be evaluating dorsal flexion first, and you're gonna be evaluating for what kind of end feel you feel, and then plantar flexion. Now, sometimes your, your patient can uh, try to help you and you don't want your patient to help you, but sometimes they can help you. So it might help actually to go through uh, dorsal flexion and plantar flexion a few times, helps them uh, relax a bit so that you can get a sense, a better sense of uh, restricted barriers and freedoms of motion. So as we're, as we're moving through those uh, motions right now, uh, I'm finding that in dorsal flexion, I'm hitting a little bit of resistance in, at the end of dorsal flexion on this right side while the left side continues to move um, in dorsal flexion. And then in plantar flexion, I'm finding that uh, I have a little bit extra uh, plantar flexion on this right side. Uh, that would suggest that this talus on this right side is uh, displaced anteriorly. So our somatic dysfunction for our talus would be an anterior talus. Now, if we were gonna change our frame of reference and instead talk about what would be the somatic dysfunction diagnosis for the distal tibia, we're just gonna be thinking of where does the distal tibia uh, lie in relation to the talus. So with uh, plantar flexion, we're finding that there's additional plantar flexion. Our talus is anterior, our distal tibia is relatively posterior. So our diagnosis for the distal tibia would be a posterior distal tibia somatic dysfunction on the right. Okay. And uh, in a seated position, we can further evaluate and confirm our uh, somatic dysfunction diagnoses in a little bit, with a little bit more specificity by going one foot at a time. And same position or same hand position would apply uh, for the hand that's anterior. But posteriorly, now we can use the other hand and clasp around the, uh, the calcaneus. And now we have a better uh, proprioceptive picture in our heads of what the entire foot and ankle is doing, where the talus uh, is and where is it moving, and um, what the position of the tibia and fibula are in relation to that talus. So as I'm moving now, I'm finding that I'm confirming that with dorsal flexion, I hit a restricted barrier around here, and then I'm getting plenty of plantar flexion. When I compare that with the other side, I find that I have good dorsal flexion, very, very good dorsal flexion, but with plantar flexion, actually completely passively, I think plantar flexion on this side is pretty even, almost the same as the right side, maybe a little bit less so. But I'd expect that with, uh, with the improved dorsiflexion.